Using skincare makes your skin lazy. So if you stop, you'll get breakouts. Aluminum in antiperspirant or deodorant causes breast cancer. Shaving makes your hair grow back thicker. Toothpaste can help get rid of pimples. Oof. Between my clinical practice as a dermatologist and just existing here on social media, people come to me with a lot of different skincare myths that they've heard and they want to know if they are true. So today we are going to do some skincare myth busting. I'm Dr. Sam Ellis and I'm a board certified dermatologist. I'm here to help you understand your skin and find skincare products that work for you. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. I think a video like this is really important because skincare myths can be incredibly harmful to others. They can prevent people from seeking out treatments that would otherwise benefit them because they're scared of potential side effects that might not actually really be side effects or skincare myths can push people to try treatments that would not be beneficial for them or could even cause additional harm. So setting the record straight, I think can help in multiple ways. Let's get started. I've written down some of the skincare myths that have been sent to me over the past several months and we're gonna go through them. Number one, using skincare makes your skin lazy. So if you stop, you'll get breakouts. I'm assuming this myth started because when you are put on an acne fighting regimen to reduce blemishes, you start out, you do your treatment, it might take a few weeks or even months to get your skin clear. And then you wanna stop doing that regimen. And when you do, sometimes the acne comes back. And that's not because your skin got lazy or forgot how to heal itself. It's because acne and breakouts is a chronic skin condition. It doesn't just magically go away. When I talk to my patients about curing their acne, I say the only way to cure acne is to grow grow out of it and there's no way to do that or make that happen faster. But we can use medications in the meantime while you are breaking out to keep your skin under control and looking its best. So it's not that your skin gets lazy, it's just that it requires medication or skincare interventions to maintain itself. The same way that if you had like high blood pressure, for example, and you went on high blood pressure medication, three years from now, if you stop that high blood pressure medication, your high blood pressure is likely to come back because you were treating an active condition that's ongoing. And the same thing goes for acne. It can be ongoing for a long time. So you need to keep up your treatment or your skincare in order to maintain your results. Speaking of acne, there were a lot of skincare myths submitted around the idea of diet and acne. So there was, does alcohol make your skin break out? Does dairy make your skin break out? Does chocolate make your skin break out? So let's talk about all of them. So I could probably talk for hours about this. I edited an entire textbook called Diet and Dermatology, and there's a lot to know within that field. But I think the thing to keep in mind with diet and acne and how they interplay with one another is that it's not a very clean science. And what I mean by that is it's it's very tricky to isolate diet as a contributing factor to acne because acne is driven by so many other things that we don't always have control over, like genetics and hormone levels and stress. And so when you're trying to look at if one dietary intervention specifically alters someone's acne or makes them more prone to breakouts, it gets tricky. So let's start with alcohol. There is no good data that says drinking X amount over X period of time is going to make your skin significantly worse or more prone to breakouts. So you can cross alcohol pretty much off your list as problematic, unless every time you drink alcohol, you notice breakouts. So if it's unique to you and it's a pattern you've recognized in yourself, cut it out. But there's no blanket statement I'm going to make about alcohol and acne. Dairy is a little trickier because there are some small studies that correlate drinking skim milk or non-fat milk or whey protein with increased acne breakouts. But again, this is a small study in a very specific population. And to me, the data is not robust enough for me to recommend that all of my patients with acne acne breakouts cut out dairy from their diet. The other food category, if you will, that's been associated with increased acne breakouts are high glycemic index foods. So these are processed carbohydrates, sugary foods, anything that's essentially going to spike your blood glucose level rapidly. So I guess you could say chocolate falls into that category, but again, like how much chocolate are you eating and how often? Really the point I want to make here is that there is not enough good solid evidence for dietary interventions and the treatment of acne for me to regularly recommend cutting out a specific food or food group in my patients who struggle with breakouts. I'm always going to encourage others to eat a healthy, well-rounded diet, but that's not from a dermatologist's perspective. That's from my perspective.
perspective as a physician and that you should be eating not just for your skin health, but for your brain health and your liver health and your gut health. That should really be the motivation for eating a healthy diet. And really the only time you should be cutting things out of your diet is if you're noticing sort of a negative correlation with a particular food or food group. Also having acne is stressful enough and overwhelming enough. There are so many great well-proven interventions that we can do for acne, whether that's skincare or prescription medication, other lifestyle interventions. But I feel like focusing on those is really where the best improvements happen. Speaking of food, although I don't know if I can really call this food, the next sort of myth was do collagen supplements like collagen powders help improve your skin and hair? I probably get this question in my Instagram DMs every single day, maybe multiple times a day. So I'm glad that we're addressing it. And of course, this is based on the data that we currently have. So science with food health and skin and all of that is constantly evolving. So there's always a chance that this could be updated at some point in time. But right now the data is pretty iffy for oral collagen supplements and their ability to improve the appearance of skin and hair. Now there are some small studies that show increases in skin elasticity and decreases in wrinkle depth. But again, these are small studies over short periods of time with a very specific collagen supplement. Collagen is the protein that makes up a very large percentage of our skin and of our bones. And the thought is, does consuming oral collagen then increase the amount of collagen that's in those other tissues within my body? And it's not as simple as you drink oral collagen and then that collagen moves through your body and gets deposited in your bones and in your skin. The thought more is that as collagen is broken down, some of those small collagen fragments can act as signaling molecules to get your skin to make its own new collagen. However, at this point in time, that mechanism of action is largely theoretical and there are not enough good large scale studies to show that consistently drinking or consuming oral collagen across the board will enhance skin quality. Now, if you're someone who takes an oral collagen supplement and has found it to be helpful, go for it, keep going. It's not likely to be harmful in any way. The only thing you have to be careful about is there have been some data reports of heavy metals getting leached into collagen supplements. So you should just kind of look up the supplement you're taking and make sure it hasn't been associated with heavy metal contamination. But in general, it's probably fine to to continue your collagen supplement if you find it beneficial. But if you're taking it and you're not noticing any improvements, then you don't have to continue it. When it comes to oral collagen supplements and their effects on hair growth, the thought is that if you are seeing an improvement in hair growth, it's most likely due to the fact that collagen is a really good protein source. And we know that people who are either calorie deficient or deficient in protein can have both hair loss and just undesirable changes to hair texture and tone. So from that point of view, and the fact that it's a protein source, it probably is helpful for hair growth for some people, but because it's collagen specifically, mm. Okay, let's move on to our next myth. Aluminum in antiperspirant or deodorant causes breast cancer. No, you might be thinking, okay, well, why is there aluminum in antiperspirants at all? But aluminum is very good at basically blocking sweat glands from releasing sweat. So they are a very effective group of ingredients to incorporate into antiperspirants. And it's been this debate for many years that could the aluminum that's put into your armpits then get into your breast tissue and then cause breast cancer. And there have been so many studies now that have shown that there is really no association with aluminum from antiperspirants and breast cancer. The other thing to keep in mind is that the amount of aluminum that's absorbed through your skin is so minimal. The vast majority of aluminum that's found in the human body is acquired through diet, so through what you're eating. And while we're on the topic of aluminum being associated with negative things like breast cancer, it's also not associated with Alzheimer's. That is a very old fallacy that also needs to be debunked. So aluminum deodorant is fine. It is not going to cause breast cancer and it is not going to cause Alzheimer's disease. I felt like this was a skincare myth that was really important to address because breast cancer and Alzheimer's are two really scary health things that are exceedingly common. I know they both run pretty rampantly in my family, but I also know that body odor is a big deal. And there are a lot of people who've been avoiding aluminum based products for so long because of that sort of fallacy that those things could cause harm to them in the long run. So if you stink, if you sweat, if you want to address that, add aluminum back into your routine. All right, next myth. Your skin has to get worse before it can get better. Example, 
purging. This is not really true. The thought with purging, which is sort of this increase in acne breakouts after you start a new product, is thought to happen when you start something that increases cell turnover. Essentially, you're taking these tiny little invisible breakouts that were below the skin surface, and because you're increasing cell turnover, you're bringing them to the surface faster than they would have come out on their own, and so it can lead to this sort of increase in breakouts, but that's actually not very common at all. The other way your skin might get worse when you start a new product is if that is an irritating ingredient for you. So if it's an acid or a vitamin C or something that is irritating to the skin in some way, your skin hasn't adapted to it yet, or you use it too frequently, or you don't incorporate it the right way into your routine, your skin absolutely can get worse until it figures out how to adapt to that, or you figure out how to put it into your routine in a way that your skin can tolerate better. But really it's not the norm for your skin to get worse every time you incorporate a new product. Some tips I have for incorporating a new product into your routine are always Always only incorporate one new thing at a time. It's pretty normal to do like a big shopping adventure and then want to try all your new skincare at once. But then if something happens with your skin that's less than ideal, you don't really know what to blame. So I say every couple of weeks add in a new skincare thing, but don't be so excited and then realize that your skin is having a big problem and not know what thing caused the issue. My other tip would be that when you are incorporating an active into your routine, whether that's vitamin C or retinoid or an exfoliant, acid, don't incorporate it every single day right out of the gate. Maybe start with every few days just to give your skin some time to adapt. And then if after a couple of weeks you haven't noticed any negative changes in your skin, you can increase the frequency of use. But I find, especially for those with really sensitive skin, that sometimes if they immediately go from zero to 60 or not using a product and then using it every single day, they're going to experience an unnecessary amount of irritation or purging. Moving on, you can change your pore size and open and close your pores. Oof. I know I've discussed this before, but I think it's so important to reiterate the fact that pores are an anatomical feature. It's like saying ankles or elbows. There's nothing you can do to open or close them. They are what they are. I remember in my health class in about sixth grade or so, someone came in to teach us about bodily hygiene and they talked about, you know, you wanna wash your face with warm water to open up your pores so you can get all the gunk out and then rinse with cold water to close your pores back up and seal them. That's not a thing. Pores can appear larger if they are filled with a lot of sebum, so oils and dead skin cells and debris. So using an exfoliant can kind of clear out the pores regularly so they don't appear so stretched and dilated, but you're not actually shrinking the pore. You're just minimizing the appearance of it, but it's not actually getting smaller. Although pores don't shrink and expand on a rapid basis, your pores can be prone to enlarging over your lifetime. As your skin loses collagen and elasticity, the pore essentially can get kind of floppy and dilate and stretch out. And you'll notice in a lot of elderly people with a lot of sun damage, their pores will appear larger. And that's where laser technology can often come in. Using heat to stimulate new collagen development can kind of tighten up the pores over time, but it's not something that happens quickly. On the topic of pores, the next myth, petrolatum and mineral oil are comedogenic or pore clogging. They're not. Determining whether a product or a skincare ingredient is comedogenic is actually actually very tricky because oftentimes the studies that prove that it clogs pores are not reflective of how that product is used in the real world and on human skin. Vaseline or petroleum jelly is actually a huge favorite among dermatologists because it's very inert, meaning that it doesn't react poorly with the vast, vast majority of people's skin. And so it's very, very well tolerated. It helps lock in moisture to the skin and is proven to help people with skin conditions like eczema. The same goes for mineral oil. It can be very, very helpful for people who have really dry, irritated, or sensitive skin. And that's why it's included in a lot of moisturizers. Now, if you're someone who uses a petrolatum product or a mineral oil product and you get more breakouts from it, don't use it. But I would never make a blanket statement that these things are comedogenic because they really aren't. Next myth, you shouldn't use tretinoin on your neck. No, I mean, tretinoin, which is a prescription strength retinoid in the United States, can be very irritating. And I know tons of people who cannot use tretinoin on their neck because it's too irritating, but you don't need to explicitly avoid it on your neck. You should try it on your neck. And if it causes irritation, then either dilute it or put it over moisturizer or just use a more mild form of a retinoid like retinol or retinaldehyde on your neck instead. But I wouldn't flat out say you need to avoid tretinoin on your neck. I use it on mine and it's just fine. Next up, shaving makes your hair grow back 
thicker. I addressed this in my dermaplaning YouTube video, but no, that is false. And every time I talk about this, whether that's on Instagram or YouTube, I'll get comments that are like, you're wrong because when I shaved my face, it grew back thicker. That's what we call anecdotal evidence, meaning that just because it happens to one person doesn't mean that that's the norm or that that's something that consistently can be relied upon to happen. And we know that when you shave, it does not make your hair grow back thicker. The hair can appear thicker because you've sort of blunted the ends and normally hairs sort of taper off at the end so they can look a little bit finer. And when you blunt the ends and they all grow back, it can look thicker, but it's not actually growing in thicker. And we always talk about this. We say, well, wouldn't bald men just be shaving their heads like crazy if they wanted to have thicker hair? Next one is you should wait for skincare products to absorb before applying the next step. This is a little bit tricky because there's not a lot of good data that says, oh, this is how fast this product absorbs. This is when you can move on to the next one, especially because the order of which you're applying your products and which products you're layering can all affect how that kind of plays out on your skin. I would recommend that you do let your products dry down a bit before layering on the next product. And the real reason for that is so that your products aren't mixing with one another and diluting one another. You want them to have distinct steps. So for me, when I'm putting my skincare on in the morning or in the evening, I sort of touch my skin. And when it's not damp or tacky to the touch after one skincare step, that's when I move on to the next one. All right, next one up is toothpaste can help get rid of pimples. Whew. <laughs> I feel like we're beyond this. I think this originated from the fact that toothpaste generally has some drying ingredients in it, like baking soda and alcohol, so they can, in theory, sort of dry out a pimple. But the problem is those are also very irritating ingredients and they're not formulated for the use on skin. So using toothpaste on your skin or on a blemish can actually cause more harm than good. I would much prefer that you use a hydrocolloid pimple patch on any blemish that's sort of coming to a head, something like the COSRX pimple patch or the Mighty Patch, because not only will this hydrocolloid patch draw fluid out of the pimple and help dry it out quicker, it's also formulated for use on the skin. And also it acts as a barrier to prevent you from picking at the pimple, which I actually think is the most important thing. The next myths, there was actually a lot kind of surrounding makeup and acne. So there was, you shouldn't wear makeup if you have acne, wearing foundation or tinted sunscreen will make your skin age and make you break out, or you should go makeup free to let your skin breathe. I overheard one of my mentors once telling a patient, your skin is not your lungs. Your skin does not need to breathe. And that line just never, <laughs> it never left me. And it's true, your skin does not need to breathe. And whether or not tinted sunscreen or makeup causes breakouts is really tricky to say because the way one person's skin interacts with a product and whether it causes breakouts is going to be different than how another person's skin interacts with that same product. So it takes a little bit of trial and error to know whether a foundation or a tinted sunscreen is breaking you out or you were breaking out on your own and it happens to correlate with when you're using it, but it's not necessarily caused by the product that you're using. A lot of times when I'm in an acne visit with a patient, they'll ask me, well, can I wear makeup to cover up my breakouts? Or if I'm working with a teen, their parent might say, hey, they really wanna wear makeup to cover their acne, but are they going to be making their acne worse? And generally the answer is no, especially if you're also on an anti-acne regimen. So if you're using the right topical products or the right oral medications, depending on the severity of your acne, then really makeup should be inconsequential and you should feel confident wearing it. The big point to make here though, is that if you are going to wear makeup, it's also really important to remove your makeup in the evening, do the appropriate skincare, et cetera. Of course, if you're sleeping in your makeup over and over and over and you're not washing your skin and you're not taking care of it, that's a whole different story. All right, that wraps up our first round of skincare myths. What are some skincare myths you've heard? Tell me in the comments below and hopefully we can do another round of this in the future. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel and I'll see you next time.